I knew Pulak very well, uh, Stravinsky quite well, I think. In fact, maybe best of all, Hindemith and uh, Samuel Barber. I think they were the four that I knew best. And uh, I met, oh, I knew John Cage quite well. Uh, we lived on the same floor and he fed me every night. I told you that, or did I? Yeah. And uh, once in Paris, I was drawing with Mary Callery, whose studio I was living in. And there was a knock on the door and it was Giacometti. And so we were drawing, Mary and I, a female nude. And so I rushed and got another um, large piece of paper and board and an easel for him. And he made the most beautiful drawing. It took him about two and a half hours. And when he was finished, he just left it and walked away. And so she said, you might as well put it in your portfolio, which I gladly did. And when I got back to New York, I had no place to live, but I knew this girl named Sonia Sekula, who had a flat uh, way down on the Lower East Side, cheap. And it was a five-story walk-up for something like 30 a month. And she was going to Europe, and she said, you might as well sublet my apartment, which I did. And the only other person on that floor was John Cage. And uh, I soon got to know him pretty well. And uh, he was a good cook. And I ate there, oh, five nights a week probably for a long time. And I began feeling guilty, so I gave him the Giacometti drawing. And he took it back to Paris to have Giacometti sign it. <laughs> and then he brought it back and sold it for quite a lot of money and gave the money to the Merce Cunningham Dance Center. That's a beautiful story. Of, like, just the energy of that I like it too. painting or that drawing. Just oh, it's such a, it's maybe the best Giacometti I ever saw. Yeah. Well, he worked so long on it. Anyway, it was very good. What was Cage like? Uh, wonderful humor. And uh, I, I was very fond of him. He had no, for instance, my friendship with Samuel Barber. He told me what a lousy composer he really was. <laughs> Stuff like that, which I didn't necessarily believe, but I, uh, I mean, he, he wasn't, I met some very interesting people there, and uh, I like Stravinsky's story, when asked what he thought of John Cage, and he said, well, there's one piece, a piece I like particularly, uh, four minutes and 32 seconds of silence. And he said, I look forward to longer works of the same nature. <laughs> and, uh, well, any other questions? Well, how did, you get to, how did you get to meet these guys? How did you meet Barber, for example? Uh, when I came back, I, I went to, I think I told you to Holland with Stravinsky. Yes, but we didn't have the camera rolling. Uh, <clears throat> well, one night coming back, coming back to my French friend's house after listening to a concert of the contemporary music that was going on in Paris, I passed the Stravinsky's, whom I'd met the winter before in Santa Fe, and I didn't feel like saying, remember me, I'm Bill Brown. So I just walked by them. And just almost out of hearing range, Vera said, aren't you going to say hello to us, Bill? And so I went back, and they were very nice to me. And she said, we're very busy here, dear, and can't see you, which I expected. But there is a festival of Stravinsky next week in Den Haag in Holland. And... We have nothing much to do up there, and we'll have a car and chauffeur. Why don't you come up and visit us there? We're at the Hotel des Andes in Den Haag. And I thought, well, why not? So I got on a train and uh, 
arrived at about five in the afternoon, went down to dinner about 6.30, and 15 minutes later, the Stravinsky's and Robert Kraft arrived, and uh, I was moved to their table and spent a wonderful week with them. They had a car and chauffeur. And the last day, the chauffeur drove them and me to the airport to fly back to the States. And then he took me to the hotel to pay my bill. And I got to the registration desk. And the man at the registration desk said, oh, the queen has taken care of that. So I got on a train going back to Paris. And I arrived shortly before dinner and I called my French boyfriend and asked him if there was a, if he was free for dinner and he said no. And about five minutes later he called me and said, oh, you might as well come along too, it's another American. <laughs> and so I went and the other American was Samuel Barber. And we got along fine and he invited me to a, house party in Corsica, uh, which I went to, and, well. What happened at the house party? The house, the, the host was a titled guy whose mother was from New York and loaded with money. And uh, I was supposed to sleep with him. That didn't go over very well with me. So one day when the Sam and his boyfriend were down on the beach, I found there was a plane leaving the island. And I got all my things together in a great hurry and went down and said, I'm leaving in 10 minutes. And the host was outraged. And Sam said, take me with you. And I flew back to Paris, and next day I got a boat back to the States, and uh, soon I was in California, where I knew no one. I was tired of orbiting around all these very successful people that I'd met. Why? Well, I thought I'd never find out who I was. You know, you got, uh, I was just orbiting around then. And I'm glad I did. And it was a very new life. I enrolled in uh, the art department in UC Berkeley and got a degree so I could teach. I've been a remittance man all these years. And uh, I met Paul three days after I got to uh, California. He was in the same classes that I was the first semester. Bill, can you say more? But because you know, one of the things that's so attractive and interesting to me about hearing your stories is that they're just littered with these idols and gods. And and so you've brought up something that's maybe not so great about hanging out with idols and gods. Can you just say more about the positive, like what's great and what's not so great about it? Well, I thought I would never discover who my who I was, uh, and indeed, when I finally, with Paul, moved to uh, Los Angeles, uh, somebody introduced us to a woman named Jo Lathwood, who was a niece of Mary Cassatt, actually, and a good painter, and she lived in a tiny apartment in Santa Monica Canyon. And she introduced us to uh, Christopher Isherwood and Don Bacardi, and they became very good friends of ours. And they were also friends of the Stravinsky's. And soon I was eating a couple of meals a week at least with the Stravinsky's, and that continued on as long as they lived there. So without trying, he, he, uh, Stravinsky was, marvelous in his own home uh, to who I met, to whomever was there. To, Once, to a bunch of gay American... Sorry? To a bunch of gay American artists and writers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, once I was standing 
while his wife and Bob Kraft were parking the car to go to a movie in, in uh, Westwood. And a man came up to us and he said to Stravinsky, you're Igor Stravinsky, aren't you? And Stravinsky said, who are you? <laughs> it was very effective. <laughs> anyway. Well, there are two stories I don't want to forget to ask you, so I'll ask, ask you them now. I have three questions. Let me just put them all down in case I forget. One, how much of the attraction, the friendship, the magnetism of hanging out with Igor and Vera was the fact that he was not just big and famous, but a genius. And second, Elaine de Kooning. Right. And third is Picasso. So do you, I'll remember, I just have, needed to put it down in case I spaced out. Uh, Elaine de Kooning. <laughs> when I met her at Tom Hess's house at a dinner party with Bill, uh, took me under her wing immediately, and she found me a place to live in an attic, I remember, someplace. And uh, for the rest of her life, we were very, very close. And when I moved to California, she saved my butt the first semester uh, the head of the department, who didn't like me at all. Uh, when I got a case of poison oak and had to miss class for six weeks, uh, I thought I would flunk a course, of course. And fortunately, she'd written me a letter, she didn't know my address, just to the University of California. It was stuck on the bulletin board. It said de Kooning, not which one. and. Uh, when I came back, he came over, put on my glasses, and he said, Do you know de Kooning? I said, Yes. <laughs> when he went back to New York to have a show at Catherine Viviano's the next semester, oh, I got an A for the course, and uh, he said to her, she was a friend of mine, when I went back to see her that spring, she said the first question, he said, Do you know a guy named Bill Brown? And she said, yes. And he said, does he really know de Kooning? And she said, yes, and he knows a lot of other people, too. <laughs> that was the end of Earl. <laughs> so silly. And who were the other two? Well, what was Willem like? Willem? Oh, he was a lovely guy. Good looking. And very... Oh, I adored him. He would sort of kiss me, not sexually at all, but affectionately. And I worshipped him, and I thought his painting was, and it still do, I think he was one of the great painters. And I was lucky that I could go in and see the women in, in progress and things like that. So you, you wound up in New York, and I know we're still tracking those other questions, Picasso and more about... Well, let's go back to Picasso. Okay. <clears throat> I first met him with this girl. I was an assistant group leader in something called the Experiment in International Living. So it was a free trip for me. We spent the first month in Chart studying the cathedral. And uh, then this girl that I really liked in the group and I decided to take off on her own and go to Antibes. And the first morning after we slept there, not together, uh, we went to the uh, Grimaldi Museum to see the Picasso show. And going up the steps was Picasso and his entourage. And I had a letter of introduction to him from Mary Callery, who knew him very well. And I thought, well, what the hell, I'll walk four blocks back to my hotel and pick up the letter, which I never intended to use. And he glanced at it and asked me how Mary was. And then he said, you join us, be the girl. And uh, Francois was among the group, and she spoke perfect English. And uh, 
it was a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, when we got to the third floor, I was lagging behind Picasso, and suddenly he hunkered down and pulled me down beside him and made a frame with his fingers. And down this long balcony, there was a, a room with a woman sewing in it, and he said, Vermeer. Then we went into the first gallery, which is all Picasso, except for this big stone Romanesque plank. Uh, bar relief, and uh, he asked the assembled multitude, about ten of us, what did we, we think it was. Well, it was a big dick and a pair of balls hanging down there. So there was dead silence, and he said, <laughs> I'm sure he made it up, uh, it was a sign above a Phoenician whorehouse. And then in the lower right-hand corner, there was a hole in the frame about this big around and about that deep. And he put his finger in it. Then he took everybody's forefinger on their right hand and held it while they stuck their finger <laughs> Anyway. So Picasso held your hand. And... Uh, then once I was with a, a conductor, Vladimir Goldschmidt of the St. Louis Symphony, and uh, who became a friend, and he ran into Picasso at lunch in Antibes and said, would it be possible to see the uh, pottery works and Valerie's? And Picasso said, sure, just say, I sent you. When are you going? And Goldschmann said, right now. And when we got there, about five minutes later, Picasso showed up and took us through himself. And then I saw him in Paris, too, with Mary Callery. And he invited us for lunch. And she said she had another lunch appointment, so I was screwed out of that. <laughs> and who is the third person? Did I want to go back? I think I should, I should have written that down. There was something I wanted to go back to about Stravinsky. It applies to Picasso, applies to de Kooning. You know, there's a really funny New Yorker cartoon about 15 years ago where the old Upper East Side lady is looking at the portrait of her dead husband and said, well, he knew Gertrude Stein, he knew Picasso, he knew, you know, but nothing ever came of it. But I, you know, I think that there's that feeling that we have when we, we read the biographies of artists mm -hmm. and, and, and read about the milieu, that there's something that rubs off, or that there's some energy that's happening in that circle that manifests itself in multiple careers. Oh, I think so. I think it's enormously stimulating and exciting to see these people. And uh, I don't know. Uh, it was certainly... It was almost too much for me. I mean, I, I felt so diminished uh, when I compared my accomplishments <laughs> to theirs. On the other hand, I'm very glad it happened. Can you uh, can you identify an, an an impact on on your work on? No. It's uh, not. No, no. There's nothing direct that I could say. It all filtered through something or other. And you're associated with a group here. You came to California to escape that group of right, women right, groups. right. And then in California, you became a founding member of a group here. The well. Sort of, yeah, the Bay Area figurative painters, yeah. Well, I just happened to, uh, Paul and I got a big studio downtown above a Chevrolet repair uh, center and shop. A lot of second room empty space, which artists began to find. And uh, one day there was a knock on the door and uh, we opened it, and there was this big, tall, good-looking guy there, and he said, got any heat in this 
goddamn place I'm freezing my butt off. Oh, by the way, I'm Dick Diebenkorn. That's how we met him. <laughs> and uh, then through Dick, we met David Park and all the rest of them. And I think it's safe to say that we all remain friends until death. I'm almost the last one alive, actually. I think I'm alive. <laughs> okay, we talk about we talk about a school. Mm. How much is that art historians putting something on you, and how much of this are they recognizing something genuine about the way that that group taught one another? Oh, I don't pay any attention to them, art historians. I never read them. Do you accept that there was a that school that, that you were part of? Does it act? Does it describe something real to you? Well, yes, we saw a lot of each other. Uh, when they write a book about it, like the Bay Area figurative book, it's, it's always get twisted and out of shape and lots of mistakes and doesn't interest me. If I were to write the book, yeah, what should I? What was important? What, what should the book? What should the book? Focus on? I don't know. I think words are one language and painting is another, and I don't think you can translate one into the other. What's the relationship between painting and music? Actually, you had a nice Brahms story earlier that related Oh, to yes. Uh, Brahms was asked why he always used second-rate poetry when he wrote his leader. And he said, well, great poetry has its own music, and I wouldn't dream of interfering with it. Brilliant. I told that story with a couple of musicians one night who were writing songs, and there was dead silence afterwards. <laughs> it was very tactless of me. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to hear some more music? This is my violin lesson. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, what, what would you like to hear? Uh, how about the slow movement of the Brahms violin oh, I, concerto? I'd, I'd better stick to the Tchaikovsky concerto. The rest okay. of it is just barely. Well, concerto. how about the slow movement? Of the Tchaikovsky? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. You play it so well. You're a marvelous violinist. You studied music as well. Yes, I majored in music at Yale because of uh, the art department was terrible. It was pre-Albers, and uh, we were 
first semester, I took one semester thinking I would major. It was an empty flower pot uh, on its side in an empty uh, dish, and I thought, yeah, thanks a lot. And so I switched after the first semester to music, and that was a very good department, of course, with Hindemith and uh, other good people, and all my friends were there. And what did you study? In music? Oh, uh, uh, music theory. Uh, we made some little compositions. I composed some what I call five easy pieces for the piano just a few years ago when I was recovering from pneumonia. And they aren't bad. And uh, I've just, I've since I was, oh, 11 or 12, uh, I've been very passionate about music. I love the Brahms symphonies and all that stuff, you know. Uh, and I inherited a lot of music from an aunt who had died. And uh, my biggest ambition was to play a piano concerto, I think. <laughs> of course, I never did. <laughs> Bits and pieces of. How did your how did your musical sensibilities and capabilities influence your painting or how they? I couldn't possibly put it in words. If it did, I'm sure it did. They're connected. I mean, come on. But I I couldn't explain it. Could you? Well, I I mean, mine's a little bit of a special case. In, in terms of the way that the, the, the things connect, because mm -hmm. I'm specifically putting together music and film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, they're not just influencing one another, they're interacting with one another very mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, but, but, but to answer your question, I think that, you know, I, start, I started making films with no training, and I knew how to edit very intuitively, and I think it's because I understood musical phrasing. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so if sure. there's a gap between, if I could hear a, a one frame, which is 29th of a second, mm. if, there was, if there was one frame too many between clips, it you bothered could, me. So I'd go and in could and you clip it? One frame, yeah. yeah. So I think that kind of listening I owe to my musical. Well, you're very musical, obviously. Um, I have a couple things I want to do with you. We have 27 minutes left on this tape. Um, I printed your Wikipedia. Have you looked on your Wiki at your Wikipedia? I don't account? have one. You do have one. Oh well, I mean, I don't have. I don't. I'm. I have nothing but a telephone. I'm, I'm oh, I see. No computer. No computer. Well, the thing is about Wikipedia is that there's something wrong in here. We can fix it. Oh. Yeah. Would you like to read it, or do you want me to read it to you? Oh, I'd like you to read it to me. Okay. Theophilus Brown. William Theophilus Brown, April 7, 1919, mm -hmm. is an American artist born in Moline, Illinois. He became prominent as a member of the Bay Area figurative movement. All, is that all correct? That's correct. Okay. I'll interrupt if it isn't. Okay. Field, abstract expressionist. Well, that's just a word. What should we make it say? Because we can fix, we can change it. I'm just a painter. I tried to do very different things. I mean, as you see from a jump from those to these, and they aren't necessarily typical either. So I don't think you can pinpoint that. I just think it's really funny that you know, in the introduction, they say he became prominent as a member of the Bay Area figurative movement, and then they give your field as abstract expressionism. Exactly, it's horseshit. All right, background and career. A descendant of early American intellectuals, Brown's great-grandfather was friends with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Really, very close to Thoreau, uh, not as close to Emerson. What was your what was your grandfather's great grandfather's name? 
Theophilus Brown. And your grandfather? Uh, every other generation gets the William. But they're all Theophili? They're all Theophili. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Brown's father was an inventor and worked as the head of the experimental department of the John Deere Company That's in correct. Maine, Illinois. While attending Yale in the late 1930s, Brown met composer Paul Hindemith and poet Mae Sarton, with whom he would share a lifetime, he would share lifetime friendships. Yes. After graduating in 1941, Brown was drafted in World War II. Following his discharge, he began to study painting, moving between New York City and Paris, meeting an impressive range of artists that included Pablo Picasso, Brock, Giacometti, Balthus, and de Kooning, among others. Brown, who studied piano at Yale, you studied piano or composition? Uh, I both. We'll add that. Uh, was also close to a number of composers, including Poulenc, Samuel Barber, and Igor Stravinsky. Did I say Barger? Barber. Barber. Samuel Barber and Igor Stravinsky. In 1952, Brown enrolled in the graduate studio program at the University of California, Berkeley, joining a group of artists, including Richard Diebenkorn, David Park, Elmer Bischoff, James Weeks, and Nathan Oliveira, that would later be known as the Bay Area Figurative Movement. Don't you think you should put Paul Woner in there? I will put Paul Woner in there. While attending Berkeley, Brown also met and fell in love with his life, his longtime partner and fellow painter, Paul Woner. Okay. Okay. Is that, that covers enough? it. Or oh, should sure. Should include him in the Bay Area Figurative Movement? Oh, that's school? fine. Okay. Yeah. And he's W O W O N N E R. Right. Okay. In the early 1960s, Brown and Woner moved to Santa Monica, where they developed a close friendship with, a, with fellow gay couple, novelist Christopher Isherwood, and portrait artist Don Bacardi. Over the years, Brown and Woner also fostered friendships with playwright William Inga? Inge. I don't know Inge. his word. Inge. He, he, well, their plays used to be done very frequently. Uh, he had four or five best... Uh, uh, sold out plays in New York at one time, but now he's hardly known. Okay, over the years, Brown and, Wo and Woner. Woner. I always want to say Woner. Over the years, Brown well, and Woner also fostered friendships with playwright William Inge, composer and conductor Andre Previn, yes. actress Eva Marie Saint, and her husband, director Jeffrey Hayden, Hayden and New Zealand novelist. Janet Frame. Yes. Well, I went to McDowell Colony, and that's where I met Janet. What studio were you in, do you remember? I don't think they were named. It was a huge studio, and <clears throat> it was totally empty. And so, Outside it was bleak, nothing really much. It was winter, and uh, on the floor was a broken piece of mirror uh, shaped like a house, a roof, and square down there. And so, in desperation, I took off all my clothes and made a portrait of myself looking straight down. So my nose was my dick and things like that. And then they brought me in a dressing mirror, a big mirror, and I did many, many, many nude portraits and a lot of heads. And um, you haven't seen my current show, have you? There's one of those drawings in my head there that I did at McDowell. What year was that? I'm terrible at dates. What decade? Late 50s. Um, do you have anything um, on Previn or Eva Marie Saint? They're uh, just two personal favorites. Well, uh, I met Eva Marie Saint. I was entering my gallery in Los Angeles, Felix Landau, and she was coming out with a picture of mine she just bought in her hand. And that's how we became acquainted. And then through a man, a comedian named Sterling Holloway, who knew her, uh, we were invited to her house. And, and uh, 
she and her husband became very good friends and we saw a lot of them and still do. When they come up here, they come to lunch at the towers and things like that. She's a marvelous woman. Anything on, um, on Andre Previn? How did you know him? He bought one of my paintings, several of them, and uh, that's how we met. And then they had a big house in, uh, oh, I don't, in a very posh place. And we used to go to dinner there quite a lot and met some interesting people. And um, he, we, with Nate Oliveira, we went, the three of us, to draw him one evening while I was studying the score at the piano. And I still have a photo of that drawing. And yeah, liked him a lot. Brown still resides in San Francisco, California, and paints daily. Good enough? That's good. Well, it means stepping into my own world every day when I come to the studio and being alone, which is very important to me. And once in a while, creation pleases me. Uh, it's hard work to, to do that. Uh, I have a lot of things that almost come off, but they really don't. And that's always the challenge, of course, to see if you can really make something that you think is a contribution rather than just another painting. <clears throat> I don't like to be a judge of other people's art because I don't want to impose my own limitations on it. So I don't. How do you square that philosophy with teaching, coaching, taking people like Jessica and looking and making a judgment, or even the way that you, even the way that you and Paul related when it came to judging each other's work? How is it different? Well, I can't do anything unless I initially like them and their work. Then I, it's better if I have grave questions about it not to talk to them at all. I think it's only fair to them and to myself. So with Jessica, I feel a great friendship and a great talent. And so it's... Uh, I don't think I could help her, but... Uh, she thinks you can help her. Really? Yeah. Well, that's very sweet of her. I don't think I can. Well, my heroes when I was very young were Van Gogh. And uh, when I was 11 years old, I did a drawing of my dad which my dad liked enough to frame and enter into an adult, you know the story. He framed it and entered, uh, entered it into an adult juried show in Davenport, Iowa Art Museum. And Grant Wood was a soldier and he didn't know I was a kid and he gave it third prize and I was I did the painting when I was, the drawing when I was 11 and got a prize when I was 12 and it was quite a sensation. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, I just, I just was beginning to, uh, well, I was in the bathtub. I didn't know anything about sex at all and I was washing down here and it felt awfully good and it suddenly, <laughs> the water. <laughs> I never had seen. <laughs> and needless to say, that was the first of <laughs> the first creative act. Creative act, yeah. And uh, of course, it was an immediate addiction. <laughs> it 
something like that happened to you? Or did you know about? No. They, you know, I had 1970s California parents. Oh, they would be sex very different. education books when yeah, I was yeah. just barely old enough to turn the pages. Um, well, tell me about sex and, uh, and, well, two questions. You were lovers with another painter, and I wonder how did the art and the love and the sex all live together? Uh, with Paul. Uh, the sex was very heavy at first, uh, for a couple of years, and then it tapered off. And I had other boyfriends, more than he did. And I felt a little guilty, but what can you do? So, uh, I had quite a bit of sex with the other boyfriends until, oh, I don't know, five years ago, something like that. Now I uh, use my left hand. <laughs> That good old friend. Well, I've been using it for a long time. Did, um, did it affect the work in any way? And did it, how did the art affect the relationship? For oh, better or for worse? I think uh, the art was, we were always each other's best critic. And he never lied to me. You know, when you do a particularly bad painting, you want some praise, and he never would do that. And so I respected his judgment like I respected no one else's. And I was very honest, critically, with his work. We were each other's best critic, I think. And that was a lot. And I loved him always. I mean, there was no doubt that I, I miss him very much. When did he die? Three years ago. Three and a half. How old was he? He was on the eve of his 88th birthday. 88th? Mm -hmm. Yeah.